<laughs> All right, here we go. Legally Blonde. Part one or part two? I did. Yeah, this is part, well, this is part one of Legally Blonde. Is there two movies? There's a couple, yeah. <laughs> I've only seen the first one. Excuse you, you're in my way. She's a law student. She can't defend you. <clears throat> uh, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ruling 3.03. C. So that's kind of interesting. It takes me back to um, not being a lawyer yet, but we don't have the same rule in New York. We ha do have the ability to practice law before you're sworn as a lawyer. It's called a practice order. Wow. So um, I um, had taken the bar exam and was waiting for results of the bar exam. And I went to work for a uh, legal aid here in Rochester. And we were able to make an application to county court um, to get me a quote practice order to act as an attorney before I became one. I was, you know, this close to being one, um, but it was, you have to show them that you could do a good job and mm -hmm. that it was an area where people might not otherwise be represented. So I was representing folks that were very low income on like eviction matters and things like that. So they're like, you know. He, so this he, is true, this could happen, kind of, sort of. In, in this case, it sounds like she's a law student and I was a graduate who had taken the bar waiting for results. Okay. Um, and it was not a, uh, a major trial, and I forget what this trial was, but. Um, a murder I was, trial. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> You'll I, see. I don't expect you would see that, but good for a movie. <laughs> Thank you, David. Counselors, approach the bench. You're not going up there. Oh, yes, I am. I'm sorry, maybe you didn't hear me. You were fired. Counselors, now all of you. Um, what I'm thinking is approaching the bench is something that you do often see in a courtroom. Um, it can be for a number of different reasons. Uh, I just did a trial this week and we approach the bench very often. Um, it can be to ask for a recess or a, a bathroom break. It can be to um, ask, ask some type of a courtesy. It can be to make an argument um, outside the presence of a jury. Sometimes um, it's, it's kind of not fair for the jury to hear you attack the other side. Um, you know, strategically, maybe you would want them to hear certain things, but sometimes the proper thing to do is to say, this is what I have a problem with. I feel as though the other side is getting into this and I want to kind of stop it before it happens. So I'm kind of giving a warning to them in the court that I am I have an objection, but I don't want to uh, influence the jury so much. So um, that's, that's a couple of reasons why they ask you to approach. L. Woods, Your Honor. Rule 3.03 .03 of Supreme Judicial Court states that a law student may appear on behalf of a defendant in criminal proceedings. Your Honor, I have no problem with this. I do. I'm not allowing it. Oh, but you agreed last night in your office when we were discussing my career. The ruling also states that you need a licensed attorney to supervise you. Mr. Callahan. That I won't agree to. Uh, I'll supervise, Your Honor. Well then, Ms. Woods, proceed. Is that normal for your own side to be arguing amongst themselves in front of the judge? No. Um, yeah. No, no, <laughs> pretty much and, covers it. <laughs> I don't know. I guess what it's making me think of is there's situations where someone charged with a crime, a defendant, mm -hmm. they have a right to pick their their attorney. Okay. So um, if they want to make a switch, they they can pick their attorney. They can't always pick their, you know, um, assigned attorney or public defender. So if, there's two ways that people get lawyers. They hire lawyers or they're assigned one. So um, if you meet certain financial criteria, the county um, or the state or the uh, federal government will provide you an attorney and you usually have who you have. Mm -hmm. If there's some major issue going on, the court may let you switch to a different one, uh, different attorney, but it's, it's kind of hard to do. But if you have the funds to hire somebody, um, you can switch whatever you want. You just basically tell them or the court, hey, I want to switch lawyers and I'm hiring this guy. And basically you hire somebody else and they let the court know, I got hired, I'm taking over. It usually doesn't happen the morning of trial. Yeah. Um, it would usually happen weeks before, months before, partway, uh, in, partway through the case. Um, 
I got hired on a case. It was a week or two before trial. Mm -hmm. um, that's as close as I've ever cut it. Okay. Um, but it, it makes it difficult because usually this is a case, especially, I mean, this is a murder trial. You'd want months and months and months to prepare. Yeah. But I believe that L was part of the team. So she was pre uh, preparing to be part of the defense yeah. and then went from being part of the team to the lead. Right. So um, I guess that makes it a little more doable, although a, a little bit unrealistic. Thank you, Your Honor. Enjoy prison. Mrs. Wyndham, you do realize what you're doing. Absolutely. Oh my God, there she is. Ella! Ella, we came to see your trial. Oh, look how cute. There's like a judge and everything. And jury people. Vote for Ella! Ladies, take a seat. Does trial come with cheerleaders? <laughs> Yeah, a judge probably would have jumped in and stopped that even faster, yeah. uh, probably almost immediately, but okay. uh, or potentially uh, kicked him out at that point. But yeah, good for the movie. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Be seated, Ms. Woods. You may begin your questioning. Um, first of all, I would like to point out that not only is there no proof in this case, but there's a complete lack of um, mens rea, which by definition tells us that. <laughs> so um, I don't exactly know Massachusetts law. Each mm -hmm. state is a little bit different. And I don't know if the movie is intentionally jumping forward to a a point of a trial or of a case right here. Mm -hmm. But in, in New York, at least, the way a case, especially a big case like this would go, is that the DA's office gives an opening statement. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a murder, it could be an hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be five minutes or it could be an hour. But they would give an opening statement, what they're expecting to prove, what they want the jury to focus on during the case. Really, whatever they have the floor for whatever length of time they feel appropriate to set the stage for their case. Then after that, the defense attorney gets to do his or her opening statement, and same thing. It could be short, it could be long, and they get to set the stage or call into question certain things that they want people to focus, uh, jurors to focus on. But here, it's kind of strange because that witness was just sworn in, mm -hmm. and then Al, the defense attorney, yes. started asking questions, but is kind of making a statement at the same time. The way that would work in New York, at least, is the prosecution calls all their witnesses first. Mm -hmm. So the prosecution calls their first witness, their second witness, their third witness, their fourth witness. And when someone's sworn in, it goes with what we call direct testimony, which is if it's the DA's witness, they go first and then the defense attorney crosses. Okay. If the person is sworn in and the defense is going first, like we just saw, it makes me think that this is a defense witness and we would have skipped yeah. all of the prosecution's case. But it's kind of weird that L questions first, but is saying that there's no evidence in this case or whatever she said. Mm -hmm. uh, it's making me confused about where we are in the trial. Gotcha. There can be no crime without a vicious will. So mens rea is a fancy way of saying mental state. Um, it's like a, uh, an evil intent or a bad intent. Okay. So uh, mens rea is the mental component. So, um, and again, each state's different on murder, but there has to be like a mental part for certain types of murder, and then there has to be a physical part. You actually have to do it, someone has to die, and you have to intentionally want to do it. That's the mens rea, it's the mental component. Um, and again, I don't know what exactly Massachusetts um, statute says. Just will. I am aware of the meaning of mens rea. What I'm unaware of is why you're giving me a vocabulary lesson when you should be questioning your witness. It's a, also a, uh, a, the judge is saying, why are you telling me about it? Um, your trial isn't in front of a judge. A judge isn't making the decision of guilt or innocence, the jury is. So mm -hmm. um, you should be directing your information to the jury um, and you're not really trying to sell the judge. This 
maybe would be something at a pretrial hearing, um, but. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Windham, when you arrived back at the house, um, was your father there? Not that I saw, but like I said, I went straight upstairs to take a shower. And uh, when you came downstairs, what happened? I saw Brooke standing over his body, drenched in his blood. So this makes me think of another situation. Again, I don't know where we are, if this is Elle's witness or if this is supposed to be a prosecution witness and she's cross-examining even though uh, the person was just sworn. There's two different types of questions that you use, um, either in hearings or trials or whenever you have a witness on the stand. Um, if it's direct questioning, you're supposed to, for the most part, use more open-ended questions. Like yeah. the common one is, what happened next? Or what did you see? Mm -hmm. it, it leads to a kind of a discussion type atmosphere where the, the attorney on direct is just asking somebody, tell me about the situation. Right. What did you experience? What was going on? What did you see? That type of stuff. If you're cross-examining, you're allowed to, you are allowed to lead. Mm-hmm. So you're allowed to say, isn't it true you walked in, the, yes or no, you walked through the front door? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then you walked into the kitchen, right? Right. Because you're controlling the right. situation. And when you yeah. entered, you saw him on the floor, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And he was in the black jacket, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And there was a gash on his head, right? Right. So you can, if you're cross-examining, you can lead just like, like the examples I just gave. If you're on... Um, so if she's on direct, she's op asking open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. If she's on cross, um, it's not really a good strategy because if you give the open-ended questions, you don't know what people right. are going to say. And it gives them a okay. lot of opportunity right. to, to explain it the way they want to explain it. You would rather box them in if you can and ask them leading questions mm -hmm. that you already know the answer to, right. or you already have they've already testified to at grand jury or they've already testified at a prior hearing, you know what their answer is going to be. And if it's not the same answer, then you can um, say, well, isn't it true you previously testified? And last time you said this or you gave a supporting deposition, isn't it true in that you previously said this? So you can start to call their credibility into question. But again, I'm confused if she's direct or cross. I think she's crossing because so that is a, a witness of the crime, mm -hmm. so. Um, uh, but Mrs. Wyndham didn't have a gun. No, she'd stashed it by then. We have to strike that from the record, Your Honor. It's speculation. So stricken. What stricken means is basically something came into the record and it was um, unfairly um, received so they they'll give an instruction oh jury you just heard that we're going to ask you to block that from your memory so that's sometimes the fix right how if, well does that work in reality <laughs> do you forget uh, yeah things? i mean that's why you see sometimes people i don't know if you, you see it in movies or other stuff but they say they ask the question and then there's an objection and they say withdrawn yeah like you know <laughs> what i mean they ask the question knowing it's not a fair question whether it's answered or not they wanted to cross the line to prove a point and I, I don't know if yeah you, we don't I don't we don't really play those type of games but if there's a question or answer that's so significant mm -hmm. that it makes it like actually unfair or arguably unfair um attorneys can make motions for mistrials okay so say before the trial there was a statement or a confession or or some something big that the DA was told, you or your witness cannot get into that. It's off limits. It's not, it's not going to be part of this case. Mm -hmm. We've already decided it. Start the trial. And in the trial, poof, this big thing comes out. One, you object, but two, you, you ask to be heard by the court and you say, judge, we just talked about this. This cannot be part of the trial. And now it is. I'm asking for a mistrial. We, can't, we cannot have a fair trial now. Shut it down. Let's come back in a couple months and start it over. Oh, okay. And, you know, the judge has a decision to make at that point. Yeah. If they're going to give the instruction, 
forget what you just heard. Yes. Or yes, this was big enough. Let's let's redo. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah, redo. <laughs> Um, Miss Wyndham, did you hear a shot fired? No, I was in the shower. Okay. So, sometime in the 20 minutes that you were in the shower, your father was shot. I guess. Your father was shot while you were in the shower, but you didn't hear the shot because, um, because you were in the shower? Yes. I was washing my hair. Where is she going with this? Have a little faith, George. Um, Miss Wyndham, what had you done earlier that day? I got up. Got a latte, went to the gym, got a perm, and came home. Bingo! <laughs> uh, before before we play that, where where we thought it was going, it's if you have your choice, you want to prepare all these questions for cross exam, and you don't want to be like coming up with them on the fly. I know she didn't know she was the lead until five minutes ago, right? But you usually would have a plan of where you want to go. But there is some. Some on your feet thinking if there's different responses than what you were expecting or a witness that you haven't previously heard from, yes. there is going to be some at the moment calcu calculating of, OK, what, what am I hearing and what am I going to ask next and what, how can I how can I take this where I want? But so the delay in between the questions is kind of the same because you're thinking in between, like, sure. do you want to ask sure. a different question? Yeah. Before and you proceed in. I think you usually see people being pretty smooth with their questioning, mm -hmm. but there's not really, I mean, you usually wouldn't take five or 10 minutes to think of your next question, mm -hmm. but there's not really a shot clock or something like that. If you're, you're thinking something and it's on the tip of your tongue and you need a minute, it would be fine to just stop, go grab your supporting deposition of that witness, read it real quick, gather yourself and, and continue. Um, but she she's kind of doing this on the fly in the video, so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But here we go. Were you got in the shower? I believe the witness has made it clear that she was in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Um, Miss Wyndham, had you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? Two a year since I was 12. You do the math. Right there. So. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's leading. Or at least her attorney probably should have said. Leading is a, is a weird uh, kind of discussion. So sometimes if it's like background leading, no one ever objects to it as it's like setting up the stage. And there's an argument too that it's not leading if if it's not necessarily a yes or no answer. So okay. um, which part, have you gotten a perm before? Yeah. I guess there's really no other, there's not really a great way to ask that. Instead of saying, have you gotten a perm before? You could say something like, how many perms have you had? And okay. then you're opening it up to any amount of numbers, but um, no one, usually a question like that, no one would, would object to it. Uh, it would probably get overruled too, because basically you can't sit there and say yes or no question, yes or no question, yes or no question, yes or no question. If you're on direct, if we believe she's on cross, mm -hmm. she can do it either way. Okay. Um, if she's on direct, you still can ask a yes or no question if it's uh, background or if no one objects to it. And that one would probably go through. I want to go back to the start of the perm question. Okay. Let's go back to that. Oh. A little bit more. There. Okay, you can't do that. 
Miss Wyndham, had you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? Two a year since I was 12. You do the math. You know, a girl in my story. Right here, she's starting to testify. Mm -hmm. She's turning to them and telling her own narrative. And you can't do that? You cannot. You're not a witness. You get to ask questions. Okay. In voir dire or jury selection, you can talk a little bit and chat about a concept. In your closing, you can probably mm -hmm. chat about a concept. Mm -hmm. You don't, right now, she's, she's starting to testify. If you're the attorney here, you object and say, is this a question or is she yeah. testifying? So you can't say like, oh, one time I got a perm. You could say like perms, you like, and give like facts about what she's, happens when you get a perm, but not your own experience. And I haven't really listened to the rest of it, but it sounds like she's about to somewhat testify as an expert here, mm -hmm. give her own story. She's not a witness. You know, a girl in my sorority, Tracy Marcinko, got a perm once. We all tried to talk her out of it. Curls weren't a good look for her. She didn't have your bone structure. Oh. But thankfully, that same day, she entered the Beta Delta Pi wet t-shirt contest where she was completely hosed down from head to toe. Objection. Why is this relevant? Oh, I have a point, I promise. Then make it. Yes, ma'am. Um, Chenny, why is it that- What should have that objection been? <laughs> the objection should have been, she's not a witness. Is she asking a question or testifying? They should say, ask a question. And she would not be able to tell her own story. Okay. So she has to keep asking the witness questions because lawyers aren't witnesses. Tracy Marcinko's curls were ruined when she got hosed down. Because they got wet? Exactly, because isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours after getting a perm at the risk of deactivating the ammonium thyglocolate? Uh, yes. And wouldn't somebody who's had, say, 30 perms before in their life be well aware of this rule? And if, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you had heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs, which would mean that you would have had to have found Mrs. Wyndham with a gun in her hand to make your story plausible. Isn't that right? She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chutney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. Oh. So that was good. Um, now what? For, good, for, <laughs> good for the movie. It was the classic, like, attorney gets the person to break down and mm -hmm. confess. It's... Um, I think it's a few good men. It's the same thing. It's getting Jack uh, Jack Nicholson on edge so that he admits. It's got her so riled up that she admits. The attorney probably would have object. The prosecutor probably would have objected much sooner. Um, you're not supposed to be able to ask a question, a question, a question, a question, a question. She rattles off five or six questions yeah. and doesn't even allow the witness to answer. So, and you see her building up and building up and building up. Yeah. If you're the DA, unless you're, you just lost your focus because you're trying to see what happens here. Yeah. And maybe you're seeking, maybe you're seeking justice. Right. You know, perhaps, you know, a DA shouldn't be trying to win at all costs. Mm -hmm. A DA should be trying to seek justice. I like that. So perhaps if you think that the witness is about to break down and tell the truth and justice is about to come out of it, maybe you let it happen. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to protect that witness or enforce the rules of the courtroom, you could say, objection, she has to be given an opportunity to answer. Mm -hmm. Ask one, and the judge would probably say, ask one question at a time. Right. So isn't it true that the you wouldn't take a shower within this much time? And isn't it true that that would be because of the the stuff in the solution? And isn't that because this? And then there wouldn't have been time, right? You would. You would have to right. take that step by step if there was an objection and everybody kind of made you do it the right way. Yeah, but it's not as fun to watch. So. No, no. The the so many questions that the witness is overwhelmed and confesses is, is good for movies for sure. Order. 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 Oh. oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
must take the witness into custody where she will be charged for the murder of Hayworth Wyndham. I don't think that's accurate either. The, a judge can't charge people. Um, police can arrest people. A district attorney can do what's called a prosecutor's information, and they can charge people on their own documentation. They can also go straight to a grand jury and ask to have somebody uh, mm-hmm. indicted after presenting that to uh, a grand jury. But uh, a, a judge doesn't make a charging decision. Um, but there would she have would th- have been held because she just confessed, essentially, right? There has to be a mechanism. Like for she her. just can't walk out and be like, OK, bye. <laughs> like, um, a police officer in the courtroom would have to have witnessed that and say, I am arresting you. I just I, I watched you confess. Now I know it, it gets deeper, though, because mm-hmm. you usually can't be convicted of a crime based on just a confession. There usually has to be other corroborating evidence, but Mm -hmm. perhaps there is here. But basically, an officer would have to make the decision that there's probable cause that she she committed a crime, take her into custody, and go through the formalities. You can't just say, hey, put her in jail. Mm -hmm. You you have to arrest people, and you have to have, it has to be a little bit organized. But, um, and... You know, it would be a lot slower pace than this. There would have like been a calm down period. Right. Um, the district or the defense attorney would have either made an application to have the case dismissed, even though it's not really the proper time. So there, there probably would have been a conference between the DA, the defense attorney and the judge. And the defense attorney would be like, well, you heard that. Are, are you willing to dismiss the case? Right. And maybe the DA would take a moment and say, yeah, I, I, I will. Because the judge wouldn't be able to just do it on the fly, right? Or because it's a jury trial. I've never, I've never, yeah, I've never seen it done that way. There is moments within a jury trial where a judge still has the authority to dismiss a case. So oh. after the end of the people's proof, that mm-hmm. they have no more witnesses, defense makes a, a motion to dismiss, saying, "Judge, legally, mm-hmm. they have not met their burden. Um, they have, uh, they have not put on a case." Well, this was close enough. It seems like it was right. towards the end. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, the, you can't make the movie too long, but yeah. there there would have been like a settling right there and then probably some type of a conference and then probably the DA would have said, dismiss the case, close the case, whatever it is. But, gotcha. um, yeah. Be charged for the murder of Hayworth Wyndham. In the matter of the state versus Brooke Wyndham, this case is dismissed. Mrs. Wyndham, you're free to go. Um, therapy. Okay. We, we we see therapy dogs in the courtroom. Um, like little other, chihuahuas in pink dresses. <laughs> probably not a chihuahua. <laughs> I mean, if they're a therapy dog, then then maybe perhaps. But um, you see you see quite a few labs. Yeah. Uh, I think lab is the most common uh, therapy dog that we see in court. A few uh, golden retrievers. Mm-hmm. They're always they're always nice That's to see in court. Yeah. Yep, I like I like the goldens. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That concludes this episode of the King Law Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and check out our socials at King Law Attorneys. And if you've happened to have been injured or charged with a crime, now you know who to call. King Law, take charge.